And please welcome your moderator, partner, and co-founder of SK Ventures, Paul Kadrowski. Yay me. Hey everybody, um, I'm Paul Kadrowski, as that disembodied voice of God just, just <laughs> said. I wonder if we could get him to do it again. My kids would love that. Um, so we're going we're gonna to be talking about, uh, about California's creative disruption, that's the idea anyways. And before we get started, I'm going to just sort of do some preamble, but before I do that, I, I thought I'd go quickly across the panel and get our great panel here to sort of introduce themselves, and I'll start over on my far right with uh, Dave. Uh, my name is Dave McClure. I'm the uh, founding partner and chief troublemaker at 500 Startups. We're uh, a little bit different than the average VC firm. We have about $275 million under management. We've done 1,700 investments in the last six years, and about a third of those are outside the U.S. Great. Thanks, Dave. Eva? Hi, everyone. Uh, I am an entrepreneur turned uh, investor. Uh, this is my second fund. It's called Fika Ventures. Uh, it's a seed fund and is focused on investing in L.A. as well as uh, in the Valley. Um, and currently, I'm the EIR for Los Angeles, so. Great, thank you. Great, Jeff Wong, Global Chief Innovation Officer at EY. Uh, after Dave's introduction, I need that title, Chief Troublemaker, that's much better. <laughs> uh, my job is to do new things and to do old things in new ways for EY and think about how we can uh, transform our firm over the next five to 10 years to help actually pace the change that's out there. My name is Gunnar Lovelace, uh, um, entrepreneur, investor, uh, co-founder of Thrive Market. Uh, you know, we've been on a very rapid growth trajectory here in LA. Uh, our, our business is focused on selling everything you get at Whole Foods, but 25 to 50% off ship nationally. Nice. And, uh, my name is Rob Freeland from Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, I'm the market manager for Los Angeles, and we work with about 500 technology companies here in the greater Los Angeles area. Uh, helping them with everything from lending at the very, very earliest stage, two, per, two people, a dog, and an idea, all the way up through large enterprises here, uh, public companies in Los Angeles. Great. Thanks, everybody. So um, just to kind of frame the conversation a bit, and then um, I'll get out of the way, and we'll make this a, as much of a conversation as we can. And we are going to leave time um, towards the end for, uh, for questions or comments or anything you have. So keep that in mind. Um, maybe just start off by thinking a little bit about what makes California sort of unusual and make things specific rather than getting caught up in you know, buzzwords like disruption and what have you. So you know, California is a, a sort of a remarkable <coughs> place in, you know, in any way you want to measure it from the standpoint of sort of innovation and technology companies. Something like 35 of the 500 largest companies by market capitalization in the world all right here in California. Um, on the order of something like 50% of domestic venture capital, all right here in California, a quarter of global venture capital happening in a single state, happening here in California. I mean, these are all sort of astonishing statistics in terms of you know, testifying to this sort of remarkable you know, test tube, this kind of experiment in creative, dis in sort of creative disruption and innovation that's happening um, you know, both by accident and by design here in California. So that, you know, there's an awful lot of things that sort of point to how incredibly successful the state has been in terms of company production, job creation, most jobs, most net new job creation, Kauffman Foundation's been on about this for years, but come from venture-backed companies, small companies funded by venture capitalists now a primary source of job creation. So this idea, not so much a testimony towards you know, venture capitalists, but more the idea of technology and disruption-driven companies driving most of economic growth. So this is a, a really remarkable phenomenon. But then on the other end of the continuum, um, you have something like 20% of Californians living at or near the poverty line. It's a pretty remarkable discontinuity in the state in terms of the incredible success of a, a, a whole sort of coterie of people living in the particular in the Bay Area. Uh, and then much of Eastern California is almost like a different state altogether, uh, Central and Eastern California. So we have this incredible phenomenon that's sort of here that sort of divides the state in economic terms in many ways and is mirrored in a sense in what you're seeing happen around the world and across the United States in terms of the rise of populism in the sense that, you know, that there's an awful lot of people who are doing very well, but what about me? And so we'll get a lot of promises that say that, you know, well, technology always destroys jobs and creates jobs. There's a lot of these sorts of soft sort of panacea that are thrown out, and these are the kinds of things I think we really want to dive into. Is, is, it, is it the case? What can we do to sort of make sure that as we go through this sort of wrenching transformation in California that we become a kind of an exemplar, right? An example of what 
other, <laughs> other, other states in the union might look to and say, okay, well, here's how California's handled this incredibly wrenching change that it's, it's found itself in. So I'm hoping we can talk a little bit about that. So we'll sort of walk across a lot of the different areas where this sort of, uh, this is playing out in California and talk about what we do well, what we do poorly, what we can look forward to, and you know, as much as possible talk to, sort of from our own experience as investors and entrepreneurs and uh, financiers in general. So I thought not to uh, sort of um, put your, anyone too much on the spot, but Rob and I were having a conversation on the way in a little bit about sort of disruption and innovation in general and what's so appealing about it. Maybe, Rob, why don't you start us off by sort of framing things and talk a little bit about, you know, what is it about this phenomenon that we like, what, what is it that we like so much about it? What, are, what, what does it do so, so well for us that's important um, and in California? And what do, we do, what do we do well in that regard with respect to creating disruptive companies? So, I mean, I think largely speaking, California creates the, the most, the greatest number of disruptive companies in, in the United States. I don't know that too many people would argue that. Uh, that point. Um, what do we do well? I mean, what we do well is we, uh, we allow ourselves to, to fail quickly, fail often, and, uh, and, and pivot, and take, take ideas that failed and turn them into successful ones. Um, you know, you can point to any number of examples, uh, whether it's St Steve Jobs pivot uh, with Next and moving back to Apple and creating uh, a whole number of uh, creative, uh, both hardware and software products that uh, become the large, you know, the backbone of what consumer, what consumers experience in, in terms of their their mobile uh, and uh, and computing power at home, um, as well as entertainment. You know, I would say one of the things that one of the things we don't do well is we don't reconcile um, the the dissonance between the the disruption and and the innovation and. One of actually one of Paul's investments, a company called Wealthfront, um, the CEO Andy Ratcliffe uh, wrote an interesting article about uh, in TechCrunch about how there's a difference between uh, innovation and and disruption, and there are two kinds of disruption. One is new disruption, and one is low end disruption. And the the difference is that you know one you're giving people a, a new opportunity. So uh, company that uh, Ava, I'd love to have Ava talk about uh, Applied Semantics. Uh, was instrumental in helping Google become what it is today in the advertising space, and what that company went through uh, to to eventually become part of Google, and then Google disrupts the entire advertising space by uh, allowing you as a as a business to advertise for as little as a dollar or five dollars, uh, where prior to that, if you wanted as a small or medium sized business uh, or a startup, if you wanted to advertise, you had to pay Yahoo or uh, another similar digital provider, uh, $5,000, $10,000 in order to, to build the creative, to deploy that and, and then come back and, uh, and reap the benefits uh, of digital advertising. So w what we haven't done well in California or, or anywhere in the United States is reconcile back to what we're experiencing in San Francisco today, which is the social, social disruption that happens as a result of uh, all the success of technology. Uh, and so that's that's one thing I'd love to hear from from Eva about uh, in terms of uh, what was it what was it like to be a part of one of the biggest transformations in in technology and what did what are the social aspects the social implications that came out of the success of Google and the success that followed uh, any number of the early employees um, on the social side you want to do you want to weigh on on this yeah side? sure thanks Rob for that shout out uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, you know, we built Apply Semantics in the late 1990s, um, and it became sort of the, uh, uh, the monetization platform for Google under the moniker AdSense. Um, I, I don't think we even know, knew what we were doing back then or the importance of that, uh, the ability to keep the web generally free for everyone. Um, I think, you know, I agree with Rob. I think technology has fundamentally altered how we think about work, um, how we entertain ourselves, how we think about community, our sense of self, our sense of family. So it's very broad, right? It's not just work, right? It's issues around privacy. Um, I think software has great power uh, to shape uh, how we live and shape, honestly, shape our realities. I mean, I think you see sort of with, with this election um, how because of network effects, because of Facebook and Google promoting certain things, uh, the news does get skewed. Uh, so we have to think about all the positives of technology uh, as well as some of the challenges they bring. And as founders and innovators, that we really have a social and civic responsibility uh, to be aware of uh, the sort of the power and some of the challenges that come with technology. 
So, I want to just take the, Ava, I want to just push that a little bit further along. I mean, when you think about some of the, um, when you think about some of the challenges, this tendency in the technology community in particular, you often hear people say, you know, we're always at each point, these sorts of inflection points when there's all kinds of disruption going on in the economy, people will say, well, you know, this, where are all the new jobs going to come from? And there's always this temptation to say that. And then the technology community's answer is, oh, everyone, people say that every time. At every inflection point, there's always people worrying about what's going to happen to all the buggy whip manufacturers, what's going to happen to all these people. It'll all work out. Don't worry your pretty little heads about it. And then on the, on, on the other side, you'll always have a group of people who say, you know, I get that, but this time, this time it's different. This time we're truly you know, emptying out a whole section of the economy, and it's not clear where you're going to put all these people. So let's make a, put a fine point on this. The advertising industry. The advertising industry is truly truly being hollowed out in, a, in an unprecedented way. There are an awful lot of, and you know, I don't know how sympathetic we all feel towards sort of you know, the average Caucasian male on, on uh, Madison Avenue in New York, but nevertheless, there's an awful lot of them going out and <laughs> losing their jobs, right? So where are they, where, where, do we have any obligation to even think about where all these people are gonna go, or we just wave our hands and say, in all disruptive moments, this is what happens, you know, break eggs, make omelet, people become unemployed, magic happens, jobs appear. How, how thoughtful do we need to be about this, or are we just wasting our time even thinking about it? No, I think we should think about it. I think we should think about more sort of wealth distribution, sort of now heading up uh, a lot more to the 1% and the divide. But from an elimination of job perspective, uh, yeah, jobs will be destroyed. That's like, you know, I do agree, agree in history. There have been many points where jobs have been destroyed. But at the same time, there have been a lot of new jobs. You know, now we have Uber drivers. We have social media marketers. Um, you know, we have lots of folks who have graphic designers. Uh, so I don't think, I'm an optimist. I don't think uh, uh, as humans that, you know, when a job gets taken away, we just sit there and like twiddle our thumbs. I think we have immense potential as humans and a lot of ingenuity. I have great faith that we will find other avenues uh, to be employed. So that's sort of my, my perspective. Um, Gunnar, do you want to weigh in on this? Because you sort of talked about this a little bit before we came out, but about sort of the, you know, rethinking this in terms of uh, a, a sort of a different model of how economies work. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, one thing, you know, I, I grew up really poor, single mom, Latino immigrant, here illegally eight years as a child. So I, I kind of straddle both worlds. Mm. You know, lots of friends that are billionaires and uh, friends that are on food stamps. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that there's a, a really interesting conversation for us to be had about, you know, what is capitalism 2.0? And uh, how are we going to uh, really evaluate what it is that we're motivated by? Uh, is it profit at all cost? Um, what are the real costs reflected in the way that we do businesses? Uh, we're in a global economy, and you know, are the 14-year-old uh, children in tin ore mines making, you know, oring the, the, the material that we need for the smartphones we use, are they reflected in the real costs that we pay? Are the chemicals that are being produced and emitted into rivers that, you know, part of the, you know, conventional factory farming, is that reflected in the cost of what we pay? Uh, so I think that there's a really powerful conversation that we can have, uh, and I think you know, as California is one of the epicenters of creative disruption, whether it's the technology, or th whether it's environmental, or whether it's the health industry, I think that there's so much opportunity here for us to imagine a new set of multi-billion dollar companies that reflect the values that we believe in that we know are possible in the 21st century. So many of the businesses that we interact with today multi-billion dollar businesses, there's lots of darkness in their supply chains, or they were involved in lots of dark things in very recent history. Uh, and so the question is, you know, what is it that we're motivated by? And yes, we have to, we have to produce great returns, and we, the whole point for me and uh, you know, my co-founder, Nick, uh, co-CEO and Thrive, is how do we show that social enterprise can scale? Uh, if it's just a conversation, then it's just a nice fancy idea. At the end of the day, we have to, it has to represent you know, great return on investment for our stakeholders. We have to treat our employees well. We have to understand what our supply chain is. We have to have the lowest carbon impact possible. Uh, and we have to inspire other entrepreneurs and have a conversation honestly amongst ourselves about what it is that we're doing here. Uh, making money is great, but I think that's you know, pretty obsolete as a central organizing principle. So I wanted to actually build on that, if you don't mind, Paul. Yeah, go ahead. So we, we use a term called inclusive capitalism, and I think that it's not our term. It's a term that's been out there. It's emerging or, or coming to right now. And it's really about this question of, is a company just you know, the net present value of the future cash flows? 
Or is it something more important than that? Is there a social component in a community? How do you treat your employees? How do you treat the environment? Um, how do you participate in the community around you? And that we think this is a richer set, there's a richer set of metrics than we're getting out into the markets today. And we, we're pretty good at measuring things, or pretty good at measuring companies and, and helping the public markets measure those things. But we think that there's a more important dialogue to be had here along the lines of what you've described. And so that's, that's a, you know, uh, you, in, the, in the vein of you get what you measure, you know, we're looking at how do we measure companies to allow a lot of these metrics that go well beyond you know, what your balance sheet looks like, what your income statement looks like, and into the world of what is your participation in the world around you. So for those of you in government, you might say, what is this company doing for my community beyond the taxes that they provide? Or if you're a community member, how are they participating in providing educational opportunities for kids in the area? And so we think this is an important theme that we'd like to see grow over the next you know, several years. Dave, I want to. This is all getting <clears throat> a bit sort of kumbaya. So I, <laughs> I thought I'd bring. Let you me in. bring it back to <laughs> greedy, <laughs> blood-sucking. I thought I'd bring you in here as the as, as the voice of non-kumbaya. Um, so you know, you're probably <laughs> of all of us up here. I, I'm, I'm guessing it's probably I've funded more you know would-be disruptive companies probably in total than all of us combined. But I mean, why don't you talk a little bit about the, the grounded world of creating disruptive companies in California? Sure. Um, I mean, first of all, I think we should recognize that we have a pretty high-class problem in California. Mm. Uh, we live in the best of all possible times. There are tons of companies that are creating jobs in California, at least in high tech. Um, and even if you look at across the U.S. right now, it's you know different stories in different places. But unemployment's at around five percent. It's fairly low. Mm. Um, the rest of the world certainly looks at the U.S. and looks at California as a leader in both job creation and technology. So, you know, while we do have issues to take care of, I think we should understand that you know we are not generally living under the threat of war uh, and a lot of the other issues that people around the world are. Um, so it's a pretty good set of problems to have. That said, I, I think we tend to believe that we know that venture capitalism works when I really don't think we understand how it works. And if you look at the history of venture capitalism, it was really intended to focus on you know, capital intensive businesses that took a fair amount of time to get started. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the beginning, that was you know, disk drives and semiconductors and hardware companies. These days, venture capital kind of looks a lot different. In the first year or two, actually, uh, they really aren't capital intensive for the most part, um, and a lot of them are not disruption oriented or revolutionary. They're very incremental. They're very sort of evolutionary. If you look at Uber and Airbnb, those are not generally disruptive businesses. They're a taxi business and a hotel business um, with a little bit of technology thrown in. And you know those companies consumed a lot of capital as they grew in the later years, but the first couple of years were not very capital intensive. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if we start thinking that venture capital is a panacea for all the problems, I, I don't think we really understand what's going on. I think there's a form of venture capitalism which is really, could be equity, could be debt-based, which is really just focused on how do we get negative cash flow businesses off the ground quickly and easily. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a role to be played for debt as much as equity in that business. Um, the, frankly, the matter is most banks aren't really doing that these days. Um, and I think most banks probably are looking at you know, profitable businesses for three years as being the things that they loan money to, not two guys or girls in a garage getting a business started that might have you know, half a million to a million dollar capital needs. Um, so whether you solve that with equity or debt, I think trying to make that a lot more broadly available to people, you know, that's what's working in California, and I think that's what can work for the rest of the country as the rest of the world as well. What I think we sometimes are not paying attention to is because of that disruption, we're going to put a lot of people out of work. And those people may come back into other parts of society. They may not. It may take a long time. It may not take a long time. Um, and generally, we don't tend to give a fuck about that. And I, and I think you're witnessing right now, whether you like Donald Trump or not, uh, a populist movement. You know, we, we aren't going to have a choice about whether we redistribute wealth. It is going to be redistributed for us, whether that's done by Hillary Clinton, by Donald Trump, or by someone in the near future that unifies the left and right. So we should probably be thinking about whether we want to be proactive about that wealth redistribution rather than reactive to it based on some idiot who gets into office who you know, is not the person that we want. 
Um, I think one thing that we should be paying attention to is there's not just a redistribution of wealth going from rich to poor or from business, from consumers, sorry, from, from poor to rich or from consumers to business. I think one thing we ought to look at is are we redistributing services from government to business? Because mm. um, I think what we probably want to start doing is having business take on some government functions and some education, some retraining responsibilities, because I think we probably have a better idea how to do that than government. Um, I don't know if every business wants to take that on, but you know, if, if we start thinking about, like, let's look at tax policy and say, okay, well, if we want to retain you know, certain provisions in tax policy for the capital that we make, the profits that we make, maybe we should incentivize that to the companies that are actually gonna redistribute some of that to training or healthcare, or other yep. things that are important to us. Does anyone want to grab yeah. one? Yeah. Well, I, I, I just want to, I, I totally agree about being proactively engaged in the conversation. We're, we're, we're facing such an intense form of retrograde populism now. And, uh, and the truth is that you know, people feel very disempowered. They feel like the system is just impossible to affect change. Uh, and the truth is that we're actually incredibly powerful, and to your point, we're very, very connected. Uh, case in point, you know, we've been lobbying the USDA to accept food stamps online for the last two years, uh, and they were, weren't budging on this. Um, and so, you know, it's crazy. In the 21st century, you can buy anything online, but you can't use your food stamps to buy healthy food for less. Uh, a classic example of the digital divide. Uh, so we launched a campaign uh, about four months ago Just to... Before you, so why is that? What's the rationale? For uh, not good question. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Rationale, I think, government. I think that's the point, Paul. Yeah. My mistake, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so you know, we, you know, we've been trying to get them for two years to allow us to accept food stamps online mm. uh, and uh, lobbying the USDA directly. Um, and so we launched a campaign uh, four months ago. Uh, you know, got uh, 320,000 signatures, 400 million media impressions, dozens of celebrities joined the campaign, creating short PSAs on all the crazy things you can buy online, but what can't you buy healthy food with food stamps, uh, letters of support from senators and congressional representatives, and then most importantly, uh, an acknowledgement and commitment from the USDA three weeks ago to bring food stamps online. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and we, f we did it in a trans-political way. It wasn't about liberal or conservative, it was about how do we drive costs if we're gonna have an $83 billion program that affects 46 million Americans, we need to make sure that the food that they're getting isn't causing them to be sick so that we have more medical costs. And as a result of that campaign, the Republican chairman of the Ag Committee reached out to us and we're testifying before Congress in the middle of November. So this is just an example of you know, a young California startup that has affected a, you know, a program that's 46 million Americans. So we're enormously powerful, and to your point, we you know, very classy problem to have. Uh, and, and I think we do have to be proactively engaged. Rob, were you gonna add something? I was. I mean, uh, one of the things I wanted to mention was uh, there's some great examples of what's happening in California um, to tackle uh, what what have been historically um, public sector challenges. One of which is recidivism uh, for for people for convicted felons. So um, there's an organization called the Five Ventures. For any of you who don't know it, um, that is taking what is a, uh, a at five years. A convicted felon is 80%, roughly 80% likely uh, to um, to commit another crime and be rearrested. So, 80% of felons rearrested within five years. Um, to five ventures is sort of taken what we would all consider uh, disruptive technology methodology and applied it to uh, to the um, the post parole period for for felons. And they've they haven't been around. And I think they've been around about five, six years now. So, uh, but through the history of their program, they're at a they're at a ninety five percent success rate. So, that is a five percent recidivism. Um, now they have not all cohorts are out to five years. So, like that has an asterisk. But at their cohorts that have five years, they are still at that percentage. Uh, and so, taking these methodologies that the companies in California in the technology world use. Uh, to disrupt themselves, to disrupt state industries, and applying them to public problems can be massively successful. So whether that is food stamps, uh, whether that is education, which I think is, you know, uh, Dave and Eva touched on earlier as, as one of the biggest challenges of that redistribution of wealth and, and how to make certain that when it happens that we don't disenfranchise a new generation of people uh, who might be mid-career 
you know, midlife and living in Ohio and their, you know, their steel job goes away, how do we take that person and make certain that they are productive in the economy that is largely digital? Yeah, education is a really interesting way. And, um, and so another to five ventures for, you know, for convicted felons who have been paroled. Um, Alt School and a whole number of other companies disrupting education and trying to find ways to, uh, to educate kids in, in a fashion that allows them to be uh, digitally native and digitally productive, as well as good humans. Um, that gives those two organizations give me a tremendous amount of hope with respect to this displacement, this uh, mm. disenfranchisement that's happening uh, around the digital economy and what's with all of the success uh, that has come. There have been challenges, but uh, there are organizations trying to trying to solve those. So Jeff, you want yeah, to I wanted to actually build on on this thought, right? So, uh, Dave talked about how technology could is going to disrupt a lot of jobs out there, and um, I know we think a lot about that because we apply technology into our business, and we have two hundred twenty thousand people in pretty much every corner of the globe. Uh, so that's a lot of people, and so when we do things like bring technology, and it really impacts. Uh, it can impact their lives, and it, it's funny because we we um, we recently you know put in some automation into things that we're doing um, in different places around the world because you know it's a better, more efficient way to do it. Uh, and but we're really thoughtful and careful about you know how are the people going to react to this because we are fundamentally a people business. And and I'll take an optimistic view, so I'll bring it back to the optimistic side of it. Um, we found that our people who are admittedly, I think, in my humble opinion, incredibly talented, motivated, passionate people, uh, loved it. And the reason they loved it is because we took away some of the more rote tasks, some of the more mundane tasks of their day to day, and we gave them the opportunity to go back to using their brain. And as it turns out, people like to use their brains for things, and our people especially do. And so I, it got to the point where we had some software robots out there, and, and there was a naming competition to name the software robot because they felt such a camaraderie with the fact that we have this piece of software doing something that they used to have to do every day, but then they can now ask the better question. So I think that there's that aspect of it where um, we can bring certain things in automation into an environment that allows, you know, in case our case, our people to do more and different and interesting things, ask better questions. The other thing is we do think there's an obligation of the best companies out there, um, particularly from the old guard, not necessarily from the new technology companies who are disrupting, um, but to be really thoughtful about how you train and teach your employees. It's, it goes back to the, the concept that uh, cor corporations shouldn't just be the net present value for the cash flows. They have to be thoughtful about how they treat um, treat their employees, how they train their employees. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this out for a second. Let's see if it works. So how many people have uh, played organized sports of some sport, uh, some sort in their lives or have kids who, OK, so pretty much everybody. Um, softball. The, softball? That, that or, was a softball question. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say softball. I'm not sure if softball counts yeah, as a sport. Yeah, I don't think softball is a sport. <laughs> Now, this, is what, this is more of what I was expecting. <laughs> there we go. And so, so my daughters play soccer. And, and what their coach does is they have a primary position that they play. But of course, um, when she can, we know when they get a few goals up, she starts swapping around positions. So one of my daughters plays front, forward, back, offense, defense, left side, right side. Um, and we all know, you know, this is sort of old philosophy of you know, teaching people different positions so you can swap them around their different roles. Um, but I think there's a second order and maybe more important thing that's going on here, which is she's teaching them how to learn. So they're learning how to learn. And we spend at EY over half a billion dollars in learning. But beyond that, we spend an incredible amount of money on mobility, switching people around the different roles and tasks that they do into different groups across you know, our different business lines that are there. Uh, we're not perfect at it. But what we're trying to do is enter this philosophy is because we are you know, 150 year old plus company, depending on which predecessor firm you, you go with, um, you know, and we have a lot of people around the world. We feel obligated to teach our people to learn how to learn. And I think that's an important thing that maybe the tech companies who are new and growing um, uh, don't have that challenge yet. But I think that's something that the larger organizations who have been around for a while can take to heart and just sort of a philosophy. Yeah, I, I, think I, I totally good. agree, and I, I think, you know, we're, we're we definitely got the same memo on that one. So we're 
we're launching a program right now where um, folks in our giving program, they get free membership, their first three purchases, a fitness tracker, a smart scale, and then ongoing incentives for healthy behavioral change. Like walk an extra mile, unlock $20 in healthy groceries. Lose a pound, unlock $50 in healthy groceries. That's funded by foundations and governments on the public side and insurers, employers on the private side. You know, we have in the you know, employer uh, economy, up to 30% of employees are chronically sick. What does that cost us as a society? Every 35-year-old that goes undiagnosed with type 2 diabetes is gonna cost us an incremental $150,000 a year. We spend $300 billion a year on diabetes-related illnesses. It's just one of several major lifestyle diseases that are ravaging our communities, our economy, and the environment. So you know, education is criti a critical part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there's so many different, there isn't like a right or wrong way to do that. Uh, and so for us, we think about how do we create a set of integrated tools that meet people where they are and empower them on their journey and gamify their experience. I just to take that in a slightly um, different direction. There's the, we're talking about education and healthcare and some of these other, uh, you know, non, I'll say, government, we'll call it governmental, governmental pieces of the, of, the, of the California economy. One of the more sort of famous uh, ideas around technology is people don't know what they want, right? I mean, if you survey people and ask them what they want, you know, so imagine it's a year before the iPhone was launched and you survey people and ask them if they want keyless phones, right? I mean, people start giggling. It's like, well, I don't want, I, no, no, no keyboards, no nothing. I, I, there's no way to enter information. It's like, you're, it's, it's a laughable idea. And it's, you know, something that's sort of for 40, 50 years now as we sort of trace the history of technology. One of the fundamental problems is that anytime you let sort of consumers out of the box and ask them what they want, inevitably they'll tell you they want what they already have, but maybe a little bit cheaper or something else. And so as you think about taking that over to education and to the, the, the public sector, where really it is driven by what people want, because we get to vote these people in and out of office on a regular basis, is that a trap? Are we unable to shake up things in California and anywhere, because in a sense, Politics is the art of asking people what they want and they never know what they want, so they just say, give us what I already have, and so you're stuck. I mean, Ava, how do you feel about that? I mean, do you think that that's a, that kind of, we can, we can disrupt things in a narrow sense in the economy where the private sector, but once we get outside of that, this whole idea of reapplying kind of the disruption rubric is kind of a mess because mm -hmm. inevitably, you know, voters are kind of like, it's like doing a market research study. Yeah. You know, people are just gonna say, yeah, yeah, I kind of want what I already have because I can't imagine anything different, and then we're stuck. Yeah, um, it's a really good question, actually. I haven't really thought about that in that way exactly, um, but a very, very good point. I mean, I think it's gonna take the alliance of private and public. I don't think just the public sector alone, and I think um, as voters, we'll have to put the right people in power that have those visions and have the elevated vision of how to change this from the inside out. I mean, that's why I really admire folks like Thrive, because I think, honestly, even on the private sector, I don't know if Dave disagrees, but um, you know, most of the investors and founders um, really come from sort of a bubble uh, or a silo, and they create a lot of things that are really just geared towards the 1%. It's mm -hmm. like the concierge of the concierge of the concierge type of thing. It was the joke originally about a lot of people who dismissed Uber at the beginning. Yeah, it's exactly. Just, you know, it's a luxury item, taxes right? Taxes for rich kids, right? I, mean, I, don't, yeah. I don't think Uber is a solution for the 1%. No, but the original, it isn't anymore. the original like it criticism anymore, back yeah. when Travis first pitched it was that it's for Travis and his buddies, right? I mean, this is like a taxi service for the... It might have originally been for the 1%, but yeah. I think as that business grew, right, it became right, a very right. pedestrian service. Ha -ha. Right. right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> yes. So I think where we can uh, have those, I think, partnerships, I think uh, Thrive is so forward-thinking because they know, they recognize they have to work with the government versus, I think, a lot of entrepreneurs and the value, like, poo-poo the government. They're like, oh, I don't want to touch any of that stuff because yeah. they just going to like slow me down. But the reality is for the big systemic changes, when you look at the Ubers and the Airbnbs, like we have to go up and work together. Um, and there's a lot of benefits of working in the government. I think it's really smart that you know, Thrive recognizes it. I'm hoping more do, because I don't think the public sector alone will solve a lot of these things. So. I mean, I think one of the things, I've been doing a lot of travel around the world the last five or six years. I probably visit about 20 or 30 countries a year. One, one thing that has struck me consistently around the world is that smaller countries move faster. Mm. Uh, if you look at Singapore and Dubai, I mean, they're sort of pretty amazing places and there's some special reasons why. Um, but at the same time, it's much easier to get laws changed and put policies in place when you only have to deal with maybe one to five million citizens and have to deal with 30 to 50 or 300. So I do think we should probably look at ways that we can experiment on you know, smaller metro or even county 
levels and let people do things maybe outside you know, federal and state policy uh, to experiment. You know, we, we've done a great job with the commercial sector in letting, you know, the lesson of failure is that most things don't work, but a few things work really well. Mm -hmm. uh, with the freedom to fail, you actually find a few things that work fabulously well. Uh, in government and maybe in a lot of, you know, civic and infrastructure, we don't necessarily have an easy way to fail and you don't want to fail necessarily with, you know, say firemen or policemen, but um, you do want to be able to experiment. Um, I don't know if there's an easy way to get that started, but you know, maybe tax policy again or tax credits might give us a way to do some experimentation. Anyone else want to weigh in on this? This whole idea that, you know, that a lot of what we've learned in disruption is sort of trapped in the private sector for special reasons that we can't, and you're seeing this at Thrive, I'm sure, but I mean that there's some, so many unique things about trying to take it outside. And, and, and you know, the example I often give is that the rare times when disruption kind of escapes the technology sector, it usually breaks something really badly. You know, it's kind of like you know a runaway border collie or something. And 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 um, <laughs> you know the example often a, a, a colleague of mine loves to give is the example of what's happened with oil prices over the last you know five years. That we were all talking about peak oil, peak oil, peak oil. Then all of a sudden, technology in a sense entered the oil business via the back door of fracking. Really, fracking is a story of technology. It's not a story of anything else other than you know better visualization and changes in technology-driven tools. And all of a sudden, the the, the technology bomb escapes the technology sector, and what does it do? It does what it does everywhere. It introduces massive deflation, right? Massive price deflation, because well, that's what happens every year. Water general. table disruption. And right, pollution. and that too. But I'm saying in terms from an, from an economic standpoint, what the issue is that every time we should be careful what we wish for. When technology escapes the technology market, it blows things up in unexpected ways, including I, I, making many sort of massive deflationary forces that as a society we're not particularly well equipped for. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's all definitely part of it, and I think, you know, government tends to move slow. But I mean, what our experience has been is the more sophisticated we can be about framing things mm. in a trans-political way um, and really frame it around uh, decreasing costs and driving innovation, it's just been uh, amazing how much support we've gotten and how much, you know, it's mayors and senators and the White House and top USDA officials and uh, the momentum now off of our food stamp campaign is just, it's been incredible. and. I think that uh, I think that you know while we're in the in this in very incredibly divisive and polarized political debate, uh, there's actually a really deep desire across the spectrum for people to come together, and I think the key is you know we we held a congressional briefing in D.C. with 100 senior staffers a few months ago, uh, with you know Republican and, and Democrats, and um, you know one of the people that we had on the panel was like a very classic liberal. Uh, and their their rhetoric, I could just see the body language of the conservatives in the room starting to shut down. Um, and so I think that the key for us is to really understand that there are so many areas that we actually can come together on, uh, and there's so many problems that we face where technology and business and innovation can actually be a, a great partner uh, in rapidly making progress on those things. So I wanted to actually add something to you. What we're seeing is, um, or what I see is some uh, momentum around government trying to do more with technology around the world. So, you know, US CTO, I think you mentioned, digital service in the US. UK has their own variation of the digital service and, and bringing in technology to government. Uh, you have uh, governments in Mexico and Brazil who are plugging in directly into people's ERP systems in order to, well, in that case, to generate tax, collect taxes, so. Um, <laughs> something they're using technology for. But what you're seeing, at least, is that beginning start of governments having some momentum around technology and using sort of the modern tools in order to plug in to companies to help serve their constituents better. Um, what I think they haven't quite gotten to yet is, I think Dave was alluding to this, is the experimentation, the ability to test things out and say, well, we'll test it out here, we'll test it out there. And so I'm hopeful, you know, it depends on different governments around the world and what administrations get elected or, or put into power. But I'm, I'm hopeful we see, continue to see some of that momentum. But along the way, Eva's right, we're going to have to see certainly um, the private sector step in and, and play a big role in helping the government transform and change uh, over time. And we're seeing some nonprofit, nonprofit accelerators who are trying to help urge that along. Yeah, and I mean, on that point, and then I want to open it up to questions here, so if folks, I don't know if there's microphones or how we're doing this exactly, but I'll, 
just look for arms. Otherwise, um, I'll open it up to questions. There is this tendency, <clears throat> excuse me, to sort of think, to, as we think about you know, mimicking the California experiment, you always hear this sort of you know, the next Silicon Valley and so on, which is one of the most unbelievably frustrating, annoying phrases I'm sure Dave hears <laughs> constantly. But it's this kind of cargo cult capitalism, right? This idea that if we just slavishly imitate all the things that seem to make California, California, I throw in a couple of high gloss universities, put in a bunch of venture capitalists, um, you know, start having you know, young people hang around at Starbucks, suddenly I've got myself an innovation sector. And you know, <laughs> it's remarkable as you, and you see this as you travel around, that this, this, it feels as if people are, and maybe we don't have any lessons to give. Maybe that's the problem. There's no lessons at all. And so you know, people are just imitating the superficial aspects of the California experiment with respect to disruption. But but that's what I was saying, is that I don't think most people understand actually how did venture capital get right, created? Right. How does venture capital work? How do exits get achieved? I guarantee you, if you asked 90% of the people in venture capital, they wouldn't know how to answer those questions. Right. And it didn't happen overnight. It happens over the course of 50 or 60 years. Well, and it's, and it's a, a two-directional sort of causality thing, right? I mean, one, I have a friend of mine who's a, a, a limited partner in a large fund loves to ask people, you come, you'll be pitched by someone from, you know, I'm not to pick on a random city, but I just, but let's just say Milwaukee for the case of, if someone comes and says, you know, I'm the biggest fund in Milwaukee, he says, oh, great, I don't have any investments in Milwaukee whatsoever. He says, so he'll say, I haven't even looked at sort of what's gone on there for 20 years. What did I miss? And you know, usually a, as a GP, an investor, venture investor, you're sort of like taking it back. What do you mean, what do I miss? Well, I haven't invested there for 20 years. Make me feel bad. <laughs> well, you haven't missed anything. We didn't have any major exits. Right then, get back to me in another decade or so. And so this is the thing that people, I think, sometimes have the causality arrow mixed up. They think that the introduction of risk capital somehow is the catalyst that changes everything. Well, and at best, it's sort of bi-directional, right? No, I mean, I, I do think that there are some basic things that get you know, innovation industry started. Most people don't know what those are. And so <laughs> right. the creation of the Small Business Investment Act of 1958, yep. the ERISA laws being loosened in 1978, uh, the creation of fund of fund entities, you know, public private partner. Most people don't understand that venture capital was a subsidized industry. It's a welfare business for venture capitalists. <laughs> uh, debt was highly subsidized through you know, the 80s and 90s. Most of the venture capital firms you see today that are 42 years old started on some amount of governmently, government subsidized debt. Now, they're not gonna like, tell everybody about that, but there are a set of things that you can do to build those industries in other parts of the world and other parts of the US. They're not simple. Yeah. They probably take 10 to 20 years. Um, and you again, it's not just the capital on the front end providing either debt or equity. It's also looking at exit markets you know, and figuring out how that happens, whether that's you know, through acquisitions, through IPOs, through secondaries, whatever. Um, you know, something we were talking about in the back room was you know, why isn't there a public market for you know, publicly valued companies that are maybe between 50 to 500 million? Why does it require that you have to have billion dollar market cap companies to go public. We're missing, you know, 50% of our GDP, if not more, is non-public companies. You know, how much, how much value could we release if we were able to take even just 20% of that and have it be public? Yeah, no, it's, I don't know. I, I, I want to open to questions here, and if there's any hands, I'm happy to. Well, can I comment on quickly before? Why don't you comment and then I'll go. And then we'll go. It, um, I think that Silicon Valley goes beyond the structural, right? Sort of the investment and the university that sits there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so like Dave, I think like many of us, we've traveled around the world a lot. I've traveled around the world looking at different innovation centers around. And one thing that's culturally different is that the entrepreneur here is the rock star. Right? They're the ones who have the good jobs. The guy in jeans at the bar, the girl in jeans at the bar who has no money and is working out of their garage is a rock star here. You know, they're the ones at the top of the heap. And in the rest of the world, that's, that's, you know, Rob, you and I and the rest of the world have good jobs. But here, the rest of this panel are the ones who are elevated to the top. Those are the ones that, that people is, want to That is changing, I mean, slowly. Yeah. Yeah. In China, that's certainly the case. Yeah. Entrepreneurs are rock stars in China as well. Yeah, and I think that that's, that's, that's the part, you know, you can, you can do the structural, you can put in the money, you can put in the university and just sort of slam in all those structural almost. You have to have the time to build in that cultural change, the, the sense of who's the, who's the top of the heap that I think allows an area to thrive and become different and really become an innovative center. Sorry. No, no, that's, that's a great point to make. Sorry, there was a, a hand right here. Yeah. Yeah, uh, first of all, I just think this is a terrifically important panel, and thank you all for these really helpful comments and observations. Um, I'm concerned, though, that you're understating 
the fundamental problem of disruption and still treating it as if disruption is an accomplishment as opposed to an unintended consequence. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dave and Gunnar made some excellent points in passing about planning ahead now so that the, you plan social change into what you're trying to accomplish so that it's not imposed by those who don't know what they're doing. I think that's really inevitable if you look at the, the deep polling and focus groups that are taking place just around the election, the depth of the anger mm. is, is really a worrisome social factor. Uh, and another issue is that you're not just eliminating jobs in many cases, but you're replacing them to the extent you're replacing them with lower paying jobs that have no benefits attached. Mm. So you are di truly disrupting the social fabric not just the number of uh, people who are employed. I wonder if you could I, say- I still think there's quite a bit of information, you know, intensive jobs that are being created. So, I, you know, there's certainly no lack of opportunity for people who have the right training to get those jobs. I think the question is more, are we providing the training in the right areas to people who may not have the money to pay for it sometimes? But, but it's in, even- But it's in even, terms of entrepreneurship, my question yeah. is, <laughs> what can uh, venture capital and innovative companies do to change the culture so that they anticipate the social disruptions and make them part of the business plan. Well, I, mean, I, I think, uh, and I know probably a number of people want to answer that. Um, I, I agree. It's, we're, we're radically underestimating this, and the, the, the profound challenge is how systemic do you go in proactively mm -hmm. designing these things? Because we're talking about, you know, is it is it done to us, or do we proactively design a more equitable future? Um, and th that's a hard thing to do, particularly in the face of the, the, the type of political debate that we have right now. Uh, I think you know another aspect of that that we see is that that there is a very strong emerging consumer demand for businesses that represent values uh, that are uh, greater than just selling a, pro a product and making a profit. Uh, and we see that um, within that's you know why our business has grown as fast as it has. Uh, you know, government used to be out ahead in the 60s and 70s with regulation, whether it was the Clean Water Act or the EPA or other types of uh, regulation that, you know, we benefit from today, um, but is paralyzed on those types of things now um, in a lot of ways, where companies are now actually leading the way on those things. And you can see that now with companies like General Mills announcing that they're going, you know, to genetically modified free supply chain or this is driven by consumer demand. Uh, and there is a, a aware, a, a, a strong- Sorry, I, I'm missing that one. Consumer demand is driving genetically modified food chain. Could you explain yeah, that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you look at more- a, 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 Yeah, a, a majority of Americans, for better or worse, you can argue the, the debates or efficacies of genetically modified food, a majority of Americans want their food to be free of GMOs. And so they're using their purchasing dollars to reward companies that are GMO free. And so you have the, some of the biggest food companies now, like General Mills, uh, shifting their entire supply chains to GMO-free production. Uh, and I think you know, uh, th that's just one example of supply and demand in a new emerging consumer economy. You know, 20, the 21st century media economy is so driven by social media and social proof. People don't trust the traditional media outlets. And to the extent that uh, a new, new emerging businesses can harness uh, the 21st century media economy and build demand for their businesses in a way that's broader than just selling a product for a profit, I actually think it's a major competitive advantage. Uh, and I think that's you know, one of the things that California excels at. I want to get a couple more questions in here. Um, sure, here and then right back there in the suit. Yeah. I don't know if there's a... So I'd like to go back to a comment, uh, Gunnar, you made about transpartisan framework. How would you recommend dealing with the issue of sensible ammunition regulation <laughs> that squares with um, Second Amendment and uh, the issue of just uh, violence? Um, what government level would you do it? And how would you and others use disruption to get some change there? That's a real simple topic. I'm sure we can figure that out in the next time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I think I'm, I, don't, I don't study that topic. Um, 
you know, I, I grew up in the country, so I believe people should have the right to be able to have guns to hunt. Um, there are some crazy loopholes out there. Um, you know, I think uh, that that's a that's a very difficult topic that I, I don't deep dive. I'm I'm happy for some help on that issue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure we're going to resolve this. Is the classic venture answer is we just may have to like, re have a, a, a new startup, which would just be a new country. We just sort of just reboot and <laughs> we'll just start from scratch. Yeah. I mean, it's a great question, but I, I think it's outside of our scope today, unfortunately. Yes, right back here. Yep, yeah, right. Sorry, yep. Yeah, you shout if you have to, but I can shout. okay. Uh, sir. Oh, meta. Uh, so creatively <laughs> disrupting the disruption in terms of uh, the unintended consequences of the negative network impact. So as we go solar, as we yeah. take gas consuming, gas tax consuming cars off the roads, as we begin to decentralize capture of water and distribution, all the networks, uh, public support networks from roads to power to water that were built expecting everybody paying their piece of the share been massively disrupted through the decentralization. Mm -hmm. Good thing, big problem. Mm -hmm. We're at the point in California where the Public Utilities Commission is preventing us from moving um, seriously into distributed decentralized water capture because they don't want to see the grid go down, right. the funding for the grid go down. So just curious if you, any of you have um, creative disruptive <laughs> no, that's a great that's a, that's a great question. I mean, it's happening right now down in San Diego where there's issues with respect to uh, water reuse, where you know, the water reuse had gotten high enough that suddenly communities were having issues with respect to supply because it was never set up that we were supposed to be so successful at reusing water. And so around and around and around it goes. Anyone, Ava, do you want to weigh in on this? Anyone want to? I mean, I, th I think there, there is innovation happening around that. A friend of mine led the effort to get gray water systems legalized in California. Uh, it's crazy that we throw away water from our sinks and our showers and our washing machines. And you know, it used to be. It's a lot crazier that we subsidize so much agriculture in California at the taxpayer expense. I totally. Conservation is great, but we're dwarfing that effort right. with the but, amount of water but, but that we the, subsidize. But the deeper issue that you make, which I think is a really powerful one, is the fundamental, the fragility of our systems that are set up with an expectation that it'll always run like this, and we're getting edge generation, we're getting dramatic increases in reuse, which is creating this kind of fragility in the system that is actually causing kind of a, a you know, like a rear guard breaking effect on otherwise sort of laudable changes, right? It's a remarkable phenomenon. And it, and it, it, it's significant in terms of it's gonna leave a lot of people vulnerable right. as the right. main uh, network goes down and the 1%, 2% who right. can afford to invest in their own system yeah. Yeah. Uh, stay alive. Right. So how do we fund the transition mm -hmm. equitably, effectively? And is there a venture form in which to do that mm -hmm. and actually move towards resilience and support the move towards resilience? But Maintain. I mean, I, I think one of the big issues is the way we produce and eat meat. I mean, the amount of water that is used in meat consumption is just off the charts. It's the largest contributor of greenhouse gases by an order of magnitude over any other industry. Uh, so, you know, if you want to talk about water policy, you know, we have to change the way that we eat meat very quickly. If, I, I want to get to a couple more questions, and that's just such a, a great, rich question that we're unfortunately we're not going to be able to cope with very well. But there's a great, there's a, a, a former colleague of mine, Chris Nelder. If you're interested in that subject, has a fantastic sort of uh, uh, podcast and web series about called Transitions. If you look up Google Chris Nelder and Transitions, this is something he's really all over and does an hour each week with some fantastically interesting guests in California and elsewhere talking about how to make that transition without sort of blowing up the the, the grid, the food supply, and other things along the way. And I'd encourage you to have a look at it. Yeah, right in the red in the back, I think. Yep. Thanks. I'd like to address the issue of diversity. Um, I, uh, I know that over 96% of venture capital goes to all-male teams. And I'd like to hear what you think about um, disrupting the status quo in terms of making capital more accessible and inclusive. Great. Anyone want to start us off? Sure. Um, about 50% of our team is female. About a third of our investment team is female. A third of our team lives outside the US and is How big is your team? White, Why don't you give some? About 130, 140 people. Okay. Um, we just uh, announced a fund we're raising for, for investing in 
uh, black and Hispanic entrepreneurs in the US that's run by a black female. Um, I don't know, I don't, I don't think it's a moralistic issue. I think it's, again, a greedy, blood-sucking venture capitalist issue. There's, you know, 30% of the US population is black or Hispanic, and the Hispanic population is certainly growing. It's underfunded. We're gonna make a shitload of money investing in people who solve problems in those areas. Uh, it's not a moralistic issue. It's a, you know, nuts and bolts issue. If you invest in smart women, they will, like, make you money. I, I think, though, you know, I know from as an entrepreneur. Sorry, it's which, really basic. <laughs> I, I, I agree with that. And that's, that's the VC side. Uh, you know, we've gone from one employee to 600 employees in the last two years. And frankly, we struggle, particularly in the LA economy, we struggle finding really senior female leaders. Um, it's, it's been hard. Like, we've, we, we spent. Really? I don't, I just don't believe that. It's true. It's true. It is it's hard. It's really yeah. true. It's yeah. really true. Well, yeah. either I'm yeah. really fucking lucky or it's a lot easier if you just, like, hire people uh, for that stuff. <laughs> like, spent, I think people talk about this, this issue all day long. Just, like, hire people. Like, just hire people. I'm not sure it's as simple as that. I mean, I think it's a deeper problem. Um, you know, it goes through the entire chain to, like, how we raise our kids and, how we expose uh, young girls to uh, technology, et cetera. So it's not as simple, I think, as just, hey, like, you know, be better at bringing women into the workforce. Um, I think to change it, I think, I mean, I don't have the silver bullet at all, um, but it's a massive issue. I mean, there's, throughout the chain of, I mean, there's only 5% of women who do the job I do. That's problem one. So if there's nobody sitting across the table from you who can give you money, who understands a problem you're trying to solve for women, it's, there's no resonance there, right? And our business is all about understanding other people's stories and motivations. And so, you know, I think some of the things that I've, I've always focused on is making sure the next generation, the younger generation of women and children have access to the skills so that they're prepared for a world where they can equally compete. Um, I don't think it's as simple as the talking about it. So I think more investment at the K through 12 level around STEM and other things, uh, just to make sure that they know that the, some of the sort of the best the best jobs are in technology, and there's a reason for women to be in there because they're the best high-paying jobs, et cetera. Yeah, so can, can can I just, a, uh, just one, one quick second because we're just at the end. So of I, I just want to bring up one point. Um, one of the biggest issues around uh, getting women into those roles is role models, and so there's a great organization, if you want to look into it, called The Board List. It's run by a woman named Sakinder Singh Cassidy, who is a uh, technologist yeah. and is now running a company in San Francisco. She helps put women in board positions, which is a dramatically underrepresented portion uh, uh, in the boardroom of, in terms of gender diversity. So that's one of the places where you can, you can apply some force. Really I still good. think a lot of it, though, is that Maybe we're putting people in, like, I just want to make this, like, super, like, straightforward. People talk about it being a pipeline issue. It's a pipeline issue if you're a white male trying to hire a non-white female. If you hire people who are non-white females, they don't have as much of a pipeline issue. And so, like, it does take maybe a little bit of increment, but if you start out a business by hiring women and non-white people in those positions, tremendously you find a lot larger supply of those people. So yeah. I really feel like, you know, you know, to yeah. rip on someone, Mike Moritz, who just finally hired his first female partner at Sequoia after, geez, 40 years, like, took a lot it's of look, not that took, hard. Took a lot of looking, apparently. So it did, it did, just really quickly, Dave, did you make a good point? You know, it, it, it takes focus and attention. It's not just a diversity in, in the innovation world, it's diversity in general. Uh, we focus on it a lot at our firm. A good portion of our executive board is minority women represented. And that's important because it gives them the role models that they need. It, 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 it's a purposeful, it's purposefully done. I, I agree not, with the role models. We bring that's, them up. That's but I think, exactly thank goodness, correct. Eva, you, you mentioned, you know, investing in the entire um, pipeline of people. So we also think that that's incredibly, incredibly important. STEM, education, getting diversity early on, that's what's gonna create change over the next you know, several decades, and that's what we need is that systemic change. Thanks, Jeff. Um, our time is up. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for sitting in on this panel. And please thank our panelists.